Hi, I'm Reg Gakla. Peregrine falcons were once an endangered species. Here in the Canadian province of Alberta, biologist Dr. Gordon Court is working to bring the birds back. John Campbell has been working with birds of prey for more than 40 years. He surveys raptor populations, bans the young, and builds artificial nest sites. Recently, Gordon asked John to help build a couple of artificial sites. John wanted to record their activities, so he asked me to help by creating a video. Here's the result. Uh, we have about 68 pairs of peregrines in the province uh, as of 2010, and uh, they uh, were down as low as one productive pair in 1970. So the birds are going in the right direction, the populations uh, are, uh, are expanding. Thanks, Gordon. As you'll hear, John has taught me an enormous amount about birds of prey in general, and peregrine falcons in particular. Here, he's looking for suitable places to build nest ledges. Oh, it's where that dead tree is. Yeah. Oh, is that dead, those dead trees? The dead uh, spruce. Right here. Oh, it's that tall part that's up and it's over. Because the cliff slumped and their nest was destroyed, Gordon asked John to build something more permanent. He digs a ledge out of the cliff so the birds are protected from both the elements and from ground predators. Gordon, could you tell us a bit about the site that John is building here? Yeah, well this is a traditional uh, peregrine iry that's been known for, for uh, many decades and it was one of the first sites that we uh, chose to uh, reintroduce peregrines on the Red Deer River and uh, fortunately today it's occupied by a pair of birds and has been for well, probably more than uh, no, a decade and a half and they're a very productive pair and they're sort of the nucleus of what we hope to, uh, to use uh, to re-establish peregrines uh, here on the Red Deer River. There have been birds here that have fledged off of here. In fact, the first birds that were released here uh, were birds that showed up in Calgary and nested in downtown Calgary. Uh, other birds from this site have nested uh, in the Rosebud Valley, uh, other parts of the Red Deer River Valley. Thanks again, Gordon. I keep losing sight of John. That's bad for videoing, but good for protecting the birds. I told John I needed to get closer, and he agreed. Little did I know when I said that, what I was letting myself in for. This is what it looks like when he's finished. The birds are out of the wind and the elements. As well, they have protection from moisture from above and from ground predators. All they need on a ledge like that is some dirt to make a scrape or a cup in which to lay their eggs because they don't actually build a nest. This is an historic site where the province is reintroducing captive bred birds. An adult female showed up here, so Gordon asked John to build a ledge here in case she comes back next year to set up shop. Here, there's a natural ledge. He's leveling it out and making sure there's enough dirt for a scrape. He uses what's on the cliff. If there's a natural ledge, he builds on that. How's it looking there, John? Yeah. Here, there's quite a bit of vegetation, so he's moving some of that out of the way. John always tries to build more than one ledge, to give the birds a choice. Let's move on to the next one. This is a rock ledge, which gives somewhat better protection. So you can see how big it is. We're digging it out. We're gonna try and make a little bit more off of this. It's uh, good and deep here. You see uh, going in. How big, so how tall, how far back it goes, so hopefully we'll get some peregrines in there. John knows a great deal about birds of prey and is well known for his expertise. John, can you tell us how you got started in this? Well, I grew up with it, Reg. While my father and I were both falconers, we also believed strongly in conservation. We started by surveying nesting raptors and banding the young for the Canadian Wildlife Service. This led us into a breeding project. When the peregrines started to disappear, they became too valuable to fly for falconry. John Campbell Sr. started a breeding project. His peregrines became the core of the provincial government breeding project, which he ran. Many of the peregrines nesting in southern Canada that came from captive bred stock are descended from his birds. Hey John, am I seeing that right? It looks like he's painting the rock there. Yes, he is painting. 
The paint simulates the mutes or the excrement that the birds put on the cliff. I think the birds are drawn to something that looks like it's been used before. I think that'll do, Dean. Yeah. They can't, they can't miss that. <laughs> yeah, they got good eyes. <laughs> Well, you got to remember, a lot of this is going to fade by next year. Right? That's true, yeah. So, I'm thinking more long term, while you guys are thinking short term. <laughs> I think you feel like you're painting a house, man. After these nests are built, are they occupied? Later in the summer, we went back to that first site where we saw John building, and here's what we found. This year, uh, a big portion of the cliff fell off, and the nest site was destroyed. The traditional nest site was destroyed, and uh, John came down and uh, put in a couple of artificial sites or built up a nest ledges that would be good. And uh, just as we predicted on a really good nest site like that, they chose the one that he built, and he also. Uh, uh, they also managed to uh, lay four eggs and uh, produce four young, which you're going to see banded here this afternoon. We're giving you some jewelry. So I'm just getting the band here that's always tied off at one end, and we try. And I've got 08 here as the lowest one. There you go. A little male. Oh. And there it is. He's got his jewelry. So I've got a male. And this one's a little younger. So the male is smaller. Always smaller because the female comes off when they're about two weeks younger than this and has to feed them. And he takes it in. Quiet girl. And ideally, you don't want them to grab you or to bite. So normally, they're pretty good this way. And so there, and as you can see, lots of play there that you want. And there we go. So, the guys are done. And now the girls. So I'm going to do 38 and 39. For the females. As John indicated, the females are larger. That's how he can so easily tell which is which. As a result, there are different sized bands for males and females. The bands are all uniquely numbered and have a return address. When people report the number off the band, the birds can be tracked. The female lays and incubates the eggs and broods the young until they are about two weeks of age. Look, I just got bitten. When the young bird's appetites really pick up, she comes off to hunt. Being larger, the female can bring in bigger prey. <laughs> the nice thing about this, as you can see, it's uh, well protected. It's got an overhang. Yes, indeed. And I'm going to give them a little bit of hand here for next year. And then I'm going to lose some of this stuff out. So there we go. Peregrine's middle toes are longer than other raptors. This makes it easier for them to catch birds, which are their main prey. Peregrine's winter in Central and South America. Oh. So we're almost finished here. Yeah.
Now one of the things I'm not seeing in here that I might have expected is some gulls or some other ducks, waterfowl. Yeah. So I'm not seeing them, so a bit surprised. Doesn't mean anything necessarily. And they may not be preying on them. You can see here's a wing off of something or other. Oh yes. I'm not sure what that is. A blackbird, female blackbird maybe? This stack, owned by Nexon, is located close to a large body of water where the birds like to hunt. Peregrines like to hunt from above. As a result, they use tall structures for both hunting and nesting. I got both. You got both? Yeah. A female and a tersel, one of each. Okay, good. A tersel is a falconry term for a male peregrine. She's above. Right above me? Yeah. yeah, looking a little ticked off actually. Just taking the kids. A couple of years previously, when the female first occupied this site, she was very aggressive. John grabbed her and banded her. As you can see by the blood on John's face and hands, she's still pretty aggressive. It looks worse than it is. When I first got up there, I put my hand on the railing and she grabbed my finger. It bled a lot, but it wasn't serious. You can see why they grow up to hate you. You grab them as a chick and then you stop. Manhandling them. Nixon is very supportive and has put a hack box on this stack. The birds are nesting in it. The plant workers are very interested in the birds. When we ban them, they always want to get pictures from us. This is number 40. So number 10 and number 40? Yeah, one of each. 10's a tersel. Yeah. So we got a boy and a girl and they each get a nice little bit of jewelry. Well, that's the easy part. Putting that thing up I think is gonna be pretty tough. Got a hole up there. Not sure if a peregrine might get in there. Oh, it looks like they're trying to cover it. The hole she's talking about is a cover that had come off the stack a few days earlier. This wasn't serious because the stack had been decommissioned, but they asked John to cover the hole to ensure that the young didn't go into it by accident. A good way to handle aggressive birds like these is to have two people. One does the work, while the other protects the worker using a broom. The birds can be handled quite easily this way. But make no mistake, they can be aggressive. Holy sh she just missed me. Yeah. This next site is one of the oldest and most productive ones. To date, it has contributed 49 birds to the wild population. This female at the University of Calgary came from that next site. The color band on her left leg is designed to be read from a distance with binoculars. These were put on the early birds so they could be tracked. When you when you hold them, you have to keep the wings down, okay? Don't press too hard, but enough to keep it firm, okay? <laughs> The equipment I use has changed over the years. I use a spelunking rope instead of a climbing rope because it doesn't stretch and it's reusable. If it gets dirty, I throw it in the washing machine. I designed this harness to be adjustable and it's comfortable. These are John's trademark goofy hat and old green jacket. I built sites large enough for the female to turn around in. I found that the best tool for digging into rock or dirt cliffs is a hammer drill. This Hilti was the largest cordless drill that I could find. Another tool I use is fast drying mortar. Here's a prairie falcon site which I've made wider by mortaring rocks in place. The rural landowners are also very supportive. They restrict access to the sites and keep the province informed. 
even loan us equipment like this ATV. And this ladder. The terrified looking senior citizen clinging leech lake to the cliff is yours truly. I should have realized when I told John that I needed to get the camera closer that there was only one way to do it. When we were done at this ledge, I made my exit in my own unique way. John likes to contribute to society. He volunteers a lot of time doing the things you've seen here, as well as monitoring raptor populations in southern Alberta. He enjoys working with the birds. John, how do you pay for all of this? I created a society called the Alberta Raptor Preservation Society. It's a nonprofit organization funded through grants and donations. That pays basic expenses such as fuel, food, and equipment. Tell us a bit more about the people who have helped out. These are people who care about the birds. Some got involved because the nests are on their property. Others are interested because they're falconers or because they strongly believe in what we're doing. Reg, you're a good example of that. Oh, thanks, John. I really enjoyed working with you on this project. It's been a pleasure to work with you, too. I'm very grateful for all the effort you've put into this project to make it what it is.